Happy baby. <laughs> so we have two proclamations. They're both the same, one for the Melbourne Fire Department, one for the Melbourne Police Department, who performed a very recent heroic rescue, which I'll read about in the proclamation. And having read the police report, the proclamation misses use of the movie Frozen which I'll let one of these guys explain later on. Whereas the Milburn Township Committee values the hard work, dedication, and courage of the Milburn Township firefighters and police and recognizes those who have performed outstanding service for our community. And whereas our Milburn Township firefighters and police officers protect us from harm, keep our community safe every day, and the township appreciates the noble individuals and acknowledges that others like them will continue to unselfishly make sacrifices in order to safeguard that which we hold dear. Whereas on May 22, the Melbourne Township Fire and Police Departments were dispatched to a report of a young girl stuck in a tree at a residence located in Melbourne Township. And whereas upon arrival, with the command of Battalion Chief Boyle, Melbourne firefighters alongside Melbourne police officers climbed and rescued the little girl from the fragile tree. Melbourne Barbarossa climbed the tree to further assist safely removing the girl from the tree, and whereas, without regard to their own personal safety, the Melbourne Township first responders assisted in the heroic and successful rescue of the young girl from this very dangerous situation. Now, therefore, let it be resolved. By the Township Committee of the Township of Melbourne, and on behalf of the Melbourne Township residents, on this 18th day of June, 2019, we recognize Battalion Chief Boyle, Fire Captain Keating, Fire Captain Persian, Firefighter Echevarria, Firefighter Unhalmer, Firefighter Peterson, Firefighter Talady, Firefighter Di Costanza, Police Officer Lani, Police Officer Barbarossa, Police Officer Cron, Police Lieutenant Ronsere, and Police Detective Mendelson, all of whom assisted in the successful rescue. And we extend our appreciation that they so rightly deserve for their selfless and heroic acts that day and others, and in insistence of protecting this young girl's life. Thank you very much. Thank you. If you'd like, I'm we have sure. one for police I'm glad and one your for maturity fire. paid off. <laughs> <laughs> Would you like to say fire. anything? It worked. <laughs> <laughs> Congratulations, Thank you. Thank you all very much. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you. We're going to take a quick break so everyone can get back to duty. <laughs> Just give us a couple of minutes, clear out some parking spots. So, quick Thank two minute you. break. Thank you. Thank Good you. night.
session. Next we have Ms. Lieberberg will do a next proclamation for Glenwood School Champions. Come on up, kids. <laughs> Well done. <laughs> okay. Whereas from May 22nd to May 26th, the Hyde and Plain Sight team from Glenwood School in Milburn, New Jersey, traveled to Michigan State University in East Lansing, Michigan for the 2019 Odyssey of the Mind World Finals. And whereas each year, the Odyssey of the Mind World Finals brings together 6,000 students, comprising 900 first and second place winning teams in three divisions from dozens of states and from many countries around the world to perform, compete, learn, and have fun. And whereas the Glenwood School Hide in Plain Sight team won first place Division I title and was the first team from Milburn Township to ever win this title. Whereas the champion Glen, Glenwood School team is comprised of the following fourth grade competitors. Anthony Cazano, Prisha Bhavnani, Matthew Peterson, Alex Finkelstein, Haddon Finnan, Sophie Skel Skelkadis, and Zach Stern. Whereas the team was coached by Elizabeth Cassano, Nicole Peterson, and Gina Finkelstein, and with the support from Catherine Nasso, Glenwood School Odyssey Coordinator, and with the administrative support from Daniel Garcia, Glenwood School Instructional Supervisor, and Dr. David Jason, Glenwood School Principal, and Dr. Christine Burton, Superintendent of Schools. Now, therefore, be it resolved by the Township Committee of the Township of Milburn and behalf of Milburn Township Community, we hereby recognize and congratulate the Glenwood Odyssey of the Mind Hide and Plain Sight team for proudly representing their school, our community, and state at an international stage, and thank all of the administrators, teachers, parents for their support and dedication to the Glenwood School Odyssey of the Mind program. Thank you. Okay, thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Going that vein, we have another proclamation that Ms. Poopis will hand out tonight. 
for down the block representatives, please step up. Whereas down the block, in down the block is a New Jersey nonprofit agency that provides short-term assistance to households facing unexpected financial setbacks. And whereas Down the Block's goal is to confidentially, confidently assist Milburn Township neighbors in need. And whereas Down the Block raises funds in order to pay for basic goods and services needed by applicants who have been deemed eligible. And whereas contributions collected from Milburn residents are used to help our <coughs> Milburn Short Hills neighbors. And whereas Down the Block has provided assistance to neighbors in need for the past 10 years and is now entering its 11th year of service to our community. Now, therefore, be it resolved, the Township Committee of the Township of Milburn in the County of Essex, State of New Jersey, proclaims June 2019 as Down the Block Month and urge all citizens to join in supporting the efforts, programs, and services of Down the Block, Inc. Please visit www.downtheblock.org. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you. Say yeah, I, I just blame a little first bit of more. all, you're the first mayor to come to one of our meetings, which was really special. Thank you. So thank you so much for that and to learn about the organization. For those of you who don't know, we're in entering our 11th year. It's 10 years. We've helped over 200 families in our town stay in our town, and it's from all of you who help donate and have raised over $500,000 to help our neighbors in our town. So to pay their rent bills when they're in trouble so that they can have temporary support. So thank all of you and hopefully everyone continues to support the organization. Thank you. Thanks. I think we live in a pretty terrific township from our firefighters, our first responders, our school kids, our sports, our athletics organizations like yours, people see their signs on the, you know, lawn signs and really don't know what down the block is. So it's an amazing organization and you really contributed and thank you. So um, now we're getting on to the business portion of the meeting. If anybody would like to stay and <laughs> <laughs> watch the, oh, look at y'all, y'all leaving. <laughs> okay, so we'll take another quick break. <laughs> The fun part's coming. <laughs> <laughs> Guess not. <laughs> okay. What, what are we doing? Okay. Quiet. Okay. May I have a motion to approve the April 16th Township Committee meetings? So minutes. May I have a second? Second. All in favor? Aye. Aye. Any opposed? Okay. We will start with reports. Um, first, I want to wish everybody congratulations to all our Milburn students who are graduating from pre K to high school. All the graduations, everyone posting online. It's very nice. I'm also very proud to share that Milburn, for the first time, has a rainbow flag flying outside of Town Hall in support of Pride Month. At the flag rising were Town Hall employees, many residents, students, school officials, Board of Ed members, and the executives and staff from the Paper Mill Playhouse. It was truly a community event, and everyone was taking selfies and posting their pictures. That was also really fun. I'm also excited to announce that the Rec Department, shh, guys. I'm also excited to announce that the Rec Department has approved plans to turf the library field. This will be a collaborative project between the Township and the Rec Department. 
This will provide a much needed and a safer playing field that won't be closed during inclement weather. After this is completed, it will allow the rec department to close Slayton Field to be rehabbed. Speaking with Alex and Bob Hogan, I have stressed the importance of this project being a top priority. It would be ideal to have had this done over the summer, but I was told this would not allow enough time to get the specs out to bid. I was informed we will aim for late fall 2019 for install, but perhaps we can push this too. As I said, I believe this is an incredibly important priority for all of our kids in town. I get emails all the time about the quality of our fields and the lack of safety and clean fields, and so that's important. The Environmental Commission met last week. They are still meeting with merchants and discussing their single-use plastics ban resolution. They know it's really important to have buy-in and communication with our merchants. The Aquafest was a big success held this year at Glenwood School. The Environmental Commission asked me to thank Alex, DPW, and Tom Doty for prepping the open space on Lackawanna across from the library for their rain garden planting. Elizabeth Volivon, the chair of the Environmental Commission, with Vic Bennis, the commissioner, planted over 400 plants. You'll see them growing as you go to the library or the train station. Next project, they'll be prepping and rehabbing the rain garden in Taylor Park behind the deli parking lot. I personally attended the library book sale on Sunday. The library had 10,000 books donated. It was a huge task to sort and ready these books for display and sale. Uh, they told me it was their most successful book sale to date, and the Friends of the Melbourne Library and the Library Board deserve a huge round of applause. So they're not here, but it was amazing. People were walking out with bags and bags of books, I, you know, so it was great. The PACS committee was formed primarily to address circulation and pedestrian safety downtown. Even though all the bond monies from Complete Streets was rescinded at the last meeting in 2018, we are continuing to work slowly and carefully to find the best ways to address the issues that have been left by the construction and have in fact, in fact left areas incomplete. Our next meeting is Thursday and we will be getting updates from our traffic consultant with more detailed measurements and more data that we will be working with. In the meantime, Two of our recommendations have been approved by the county and will take place this Sunday night. There will be a new dedicated right-hand turn lane added to Milburn Avenue onto Spring Street. It's a little confusing there because you don't know who's making a right and who's going straight through. So that's going to happen Sunday. Also, four of the main intersections downtown will have CAT, C-A-T, tracks painted. Those are those dotted lines you see which serve to guide vehicles to stay in their dedicated lanes when navigating, navigating some of our more confusing turns downtown. This would be at Milburn and Maine, Maine and Essex, Lackawanna and Essex, and Lackawanna and Milburn Avenues. And that's, you know, because you look like when you're coming down Lackawanna or certain streets, like you're coming into ongoing traffic and people don't live in town, it's dangerous, it's confusing, and I think this will be a good help. So that's going to happen Sunday night to avoid any downtown um, daytime conflict. I'm going to go a little out of order and ask our attorney, Kit, to address the situation of Chatham Road and Silverman at this time. Kit, please. Thank you. you I'm going to discuss uh, for a moment the 85 Woodland LLC versus Milburn Township Mediation. Uh, the case management conference with Judge Gardner, all counsel, and the special master occurred on June 7th. As you'll recall, residents from the nearby neighborhood in the vicinity of the site being proposed by Silverman for construction of a project pursuant to a builder's remedy lawsuit appeared at the last regular public meeting of the Township Committee. They stated that on the basis of postings on the Silverman website showing drawings of proposed buildings from various viewpoints, as well as information reciting facts and figures pertaining to the potential development of the site, that had appeared that the case had been settled. They presented copies of the postings from the Silverman website and indicated a loss of confidence in the Township Committee for its apparent withholding of the fact that the mediation was over and a settlement had been reached. I stated that the mediation has not been settled and is still ongoing, 
but that neither I nor any member of the Milburn Mediation Team or the Township Committee could comment on these postings in light of the confidential confidentiality requirements of the mediation proceedings. The next day I contacted Silverman's attorney and questioned him as to how his client could have engaged in such an egregious breach of the confidentiality requirements, particularly in depicting the project as under development when no such thing was possible. Further, I told him that I would bring this to the attention of Judge Gardner in our upcoming case management conference and particularly called his attention to the procedure to which the special master and all counsel were bound, namely that, quote, during dependency of the mediation discussions, no formal record is being kept and neither the substance of the discussions nor any documents prepared by any party in aid of the discussions shall be made public or in any manner communicated or disclosed to anyone other than the court, the clients, and their respective consultants engaged in the discussions. At the start of the case management conference, I addressed Judge Gardner, advising him as to the confidentiality breach, advising him further that the township had meticulously observed the confidentiality requirements, only to be blindsided when the plaintiff put up on its website mediation exhibits and information which had been previously exchanged between the parties. Judge Gardner stated firmly that it has been and remains his expectation that the mediation is to be carried out on a confidential basis. Counsel for Silverman related that he was looking into how this had occurred and would be sending a letter to me concerning the same whereupon Judge Gardner asked that the letter of explanation also be filed with him. On June 11, I received a letter from Silverman's counsel, regretting any confusion or misimpression caused by the inadvertent posting by Silverman on its website, stating that the posting had been removed, there would be no further postings in regard to this project unless or until a settlement is reached. He had earlier attributed the posting to aspirational marketing by the client. He further reiterated his client's intention to continue in the mediation. Judge Gardner is entering an order setting September 13th as the next date for a case management conference on the mediation, and he is extending the township's immunity to September 30. Now having received and reviewed additional documents previously requested from Silverman in the course of the mediation, and having reviewed documents newly prepared by the Township Planner and Council, the Milburn Mediation Team met on Monday to discuss the mediation breach and the next actions to be undertaken in anticipation of another mediation session to be held at a date yet to be determined. Beyond this statement, we are not authorized to discuss any information associated with the mediation, the respective positions of the parties, or the substance or status of the discussions. End of my report. Thank you. Cheryl, reports? Yeah, so uh, the library board had a meeting last night, um, and as the mayor said, the book sale was the most successful book sale they've ever had. Um, summer reading programs are now underway, and the program, the summer of science programs have started on June 9th was that chemistry show. It was very successful. They said they had about 160 uh, people there. They have t three more um, programs. That physics show is uh, July 11th at 6.30 p.m., supersonics on July 23rd at 6.30 p.m., and that invention show on August 8th again at 6.30 p.m. Thank That's you. That's my report. Thank you. Uh, we have 26 organizations that have signed up to uh, participate in Mill Wheels Rolling into Melbourne, so I'm happy to report that kind of exceeded our initial expectations, that we have 26 organizations. The DPW Ad Hoc Committee meeting will be tomorrow morning, so stay tuned. We'll have an update at the next meeting. Thanks. Thank you. Um, Tara? Uh, on June 29th at the Arboretum, there's a Craftsman's Social Great Mix of Art and Elegance. So from 10 to 4, you can go to the Arboretum and there'll be a few vendors set up for you to shop at. So 
go to the Arboretum on June 29th from 10 to 4. Thank you. Sam? Yeah, two reports. I also attended an Arboretum meeting May 9, which I should have reported at the last one. Uh, in addition to what was just reported, uh, there are camps that are still have open spots at, uh, at the Arboretum for summer camps. Pathway lights uh, will also be installed. And a Matters magazine, which is an industry publication, evidently, that applies to Arboretums around the country. Cora Hartshorn Arboretum was mentioned in that. At the also attended the Milburn Board of Rec Commissioners meeting. It was mostly a business meeting, including updates on personnel and fields and those kinds of things that aren't worth reporting. But in terms of dates, uh, every Tuesday, Thursday, and Saturday, there are pickleball lessons at the Taylor Park Court for those inclined to learn about pickleball. July 8th, there is a par 3 uh, contest. And from August 12 to August 16, there will be a summer sports camp applications are still being accepted. <coughs> that concludes my report. Thank you. Thank you. Did you need to add something? I don't. I'm, I mean, the Board of Ed met. We met. Just about the about middle school. Right. No. Okay. Thanks. Hopefully. Joint fields, and we met, but we talked about the fields. You mentioned that already. Okay, so we're good. I feel good. Okay, terrific. <laughs> um, Alex? Uh, just one report. Uh, the <clears throat> For the community to keep in mind that the July 4th celebration uh, in town uh, starts at 9 a.m. Uh, at the flagpole with the with the bike stroll, uh, three o'clock with some uh, activities uh, in front of the high school, and then of course the fireworks at, at dark. Uh, it's a great celebration that's put on by the July 4th organization. So hope everybody can attend. Can you buy tickets in advance? Uh, you can. I think you just need to go to the um, their website. Uh, which I think it, I, I don't have it off the top of my head, but a quick Google of Milburn Short Hills Fourth of July for me. Great, <laughs> Madam Clerk. No reports. Thank you, Mayor. Jimmy. Only for Mayor. Okay, and you have nothing else. Okay, moving on. County Representative George. Good evening, Mayor. Um, summer's in full swing, and following up on some of the uh, recreation opportunities that were discussed tonight, the county announced Friday that there will be a free tennis program. Uh, it's a tennis camp. It uh, will be uh, run at the Althea Gibson Tennis Center. Uh, they have uh, numerous lighted courts there, so Monday through Thursday. Uh, in the evenings from 6 to 8 and Saturday mornings, it's a free program. Um, information can be found on the county website, EssexCountyNJ.org. And second, also uh, in Bridgebrook Park, uh, this Friday, the county executive will be having a press conference on the construction of a new dog park to expand on the dog park set. Currently are in existence in Essex County, this will be another new facility. Uh, so the county's uh, investing in creating new uh, dog parks because they've become so popular and throughout the county. And that's my report. If you have any questions or concerns, I'll be happy to take them back. Okay, I don't, but I don't want to put you on the spot, but I have a resident who has a question that she would like to direct to me to direct to you. So if you don't have the answer, that's okay. I probably won't, but okay. I'll do my best. Okay. Could you come to the podium, just state sure. your name and address, please. Thank you, Mayor. Um, would you come? Name and address. Oh, sorry, Judy Rosenthal, 12 Marion Avenue, Short Hills. Thank you. Um, would you kindly ask the representative to ask the county executive um, why he has not responded through, either directly, because I sent an email to him, and also to his assistant, Mr. Pugliese, P-U-G-L-I-E-S-E, uh, regarding the a uh, large number of trees that have been cut down, mature trees that have been cut down along Brookside Drive, and also to address my concerns about flooding. We had asked if we could have a meeting with the county representative, and um, it's been about three weeks, and I have not received a response from either Mr. DiVincenzo or his assistant, Mr. Pugliese, and uh, myself and a large number of his, his meaning County executives, constituents would like an answer. If you would send that to, those questions to me in writing. Okay. And George, if you could just give your email address, and we could both be copied on that, would be helpful. Okay. Do Thank you. you. Uh, Judy, can you just grab a piece of paper here? Here's a piece of paper. Oh, thank you very much. <laughs> we try to help. Okay. All right.
Anybody else have a question for the county? Oh, you could just ask George. Yeah, he'll write it down for you. Oh, okay. Okay. All right, thank you. Mary. You're welcome. Mr. Mazur, do you have a question for the no, county exec? Okay. Oh, okay. Um, <laughs> oh, awesome. Good here. Okay. So I think we're done with that portion. Um, before we move on to our public comments, we have our um, presentation tonight from the Wells Fargo property representatives. If you would all step forward, introduce yourself. Hi, good, good evening. evening. Mayor, fellow uh, township committee members, my name is Mark Yeager. Uh, I will go into a little bit of background about how, who I am and how I've become involved with uh, the property at uh, 397 Milburn Avenue. Uh, with me tonight is Stuart Johnson, our architect from Mineral and Wasco, and Rich Keller from Casey and Keller, who would serve as this project's planner and engineer. Thank you. So I'd like to begin by thanking you for allowing us the opportunity to speak with you this evening about the Wells Fargo property at 397 Milburn Avenue, which I'm sure you're all very familiar with. As I had said, uh, my name is Mark Yeager, and I am uh, the joint venture development partner of Beehive Properties, who are the owners of the Wells Fargo Bank Building at 397 Milburn Avenue. I have been a commercial and multifamily real estate developer for almost 30 years in the northern New Jersey marketplace. I was raised in Madison, and I've lived in Summit for the past 23 years. Over the past 10 years, I have focused most of my commercial and residential development efforts in train line centric suburban communities like Summit and Madison, Westfield and Morristown. My primary partner contacts from Beehive Properties live in Florida and Texas and so unfortunately we're unable to attend this evening, but most certainly will attend future meetings if given the opportunity. Beehive Properties is comprised of descendants of the Hearth family the family that first established a successful florist operation in the late 1800s and acquired the 397 Milburn Avenue property in the early 1920s. It housed their flower shop and greenhouses, and as a matter of fact, throughout the 1920s and 1930s, some family members lived on the property as well. Future generations of the Hearth family ran the florist operation at the Milburn Avenue location until the early 1950s, when a new office building was constructed on the property for the First National Bank of Milburn. Various financial, financial institutions have occupied the original building along with various renovations and expansions that have been completed over the years until most recently when Wells Fargo Bank, who had occupied the, bank, bank, the building for the past many years, vacated it for a newer and more modern branch on the northern end of Milburn Avenue in December of 2018. Beehive Properties has continuously owned this property throughout this time for almost 100 years. When it became apparent in early 2018 that Wells Fargo was vacating the building, the family contacted me through a mutual acquaintance to assist them in creating a plan to redevelop the property into something more appropriate and relevant for today's suburban downtowns. At no time did the family express any interest in selling the property but instead, because of their history and sentimental attachment to the property, very much wanted to align themselves with a real estate professional who would share their vision to transform the property into something new and modern and beneficial to the town of Milburn and something that the ownership, town officials, and town residents could all be proud of. The first thing we did beginning in early 2018 was completed a zoning review of the existing B4 zone to determine what could be developed on the site without requiring the zoning variances that can sometimes be challenging and problematic for municipalities to deal with. It became apparent very quickly that the existing B4 zone, which comprises most of the downtown district, is a bit archaic and very restrictive when it comes to two important and more contemporary zoning requirements and criteria, those being height and permitted use. The height limitation in the B4 zone is currently a two-story, 28-foot height maximum. 
and the permitted uses are also fairly restrictive, which are limited to first floor office uses with a first floor preference for retail space and second floor permitted uses of either office space or residential units over first floor retail space. One example of an as of right development on this site, which would be a project requiring no significant variances, would be complete ground level parking shielded from public view by retail stores or some other limited type of office use and a second floor of office space that could cover almost the entire site. Other than it being new, we did not consider this kind of redevelopment to be a significant upgrade versus what already exists and instead would render the one and a half acre property that serves as such a prominent gateway into the downtown Milburn dramatically underutilized, unstimulating, and not at all inspirational. As we studied the market in general and the property specifically, we came to two specific conclusions when evaluating these two important zoning elements of use and height. We first determined that the property's location at the south end of Milburn Avenue, somewhat standing alone and segregated from the center of town at Milburn and Main, and segregated by town hall and parking lots and a smattering of other small commercial uses, did not particularly lend itself well or encourage the creation of additional retail space. Brick and mortar retail space in even primary downtown locations remains extremely challenged as online shopping continues to gain in popularity and use. So retail space in secondary locations, except under very unique circumstances, is almost sure to be very, very challenged. Furthermore, given the lack of walk to town residential opportunities that have been created in town, we believed that a very nice, well-appointed, well-amenitized, and well-parked rental apartment project could be very well received in town. These types of transit-oriented developments, which within walking distance of active New York City commuter rail lines and supported by quaint and convenient downtown shopping options, have been found to be very attractive living alternatives for empty nesters, retirees, corporate transferees, young couples, divorcees, a wide smattering of potential renters. A modern and contemporary living alternative that does not currently exist to any great extent in and around the immediate downtown Milburn market. We are finding more and more towns being desirous of this type of housing, whether it be to encourage longtime residents who have sold a home but don't want to leave their community to stay, or to attract newlyweds or young professionals into town who would hopefully stay and eventually buy a house, raise children, and call Milburn their home. Young and older people alike are gravitating towards these more urban type suburban communities where shopping and restaurants and other conveniences and amenities are within walking distance to their home. Clearly an additional benefit for downtown merchants is the economic development opportunity of providing walking wallets on the streets that can shop and purchase goods and services and help support the local retail community. Today every downtown needs more foot traffic particularly on weekdays when so much of the resident population leaves, leaves town to work elsewhere, and Milburn is no different. One way to contribute to the foot traffic dilemma is to put greater density in a variety of living alternatives in convenient locations that are walkable to town. That is exactly the opportunity that presents itself at 397 Milburn Avenue, and those were the driving forces behind the concept plan that we're going to share with you in just a minute. I also wanted to touch briefly on our review and consideration of the height issue. We studied the height question very closely, knowing that it would be a topic of sensitivity to many in town. As you will see shortly, we believe our concept plan has created an effective compromise in addressing height. One of the important characteristics of the 397 Milburn Avenue site is that the street elevation at Essex is almost 10 feet higher than the street elevation at Milburn Avenue. So while there exists an inconsistent mix of uses and building heights on all three sides of this property, including Douglas, our concept would take advantage of the grade change from Essex Street down to Milburn to create a three-story elevation on Milburn, consistent with many existing structures in the area, 
and then taper the building down to two stories as it transitions up Douglas and is across from the handful of single family homes that are located there. And then eventually turns northward on to Essex where the property faces township service buildings like the police and fire stations. We believe our concept effectively addresses the question of scale and height at this important transitional location on the southern end of the downtown business district. It will blend in well with the surrounding neighborhood and provide the township with a substantially improved and signature gateway project that everyone can be proud of. Before I turn the balance of our presentation on our concept plan over to our architect, Stuart Johnson of Minnow and Wasco, I wanted to provide you the high level data points of our plan, which are the following. The concept plan that you're going to be reviewing this evening is a total of 56 units, 47 market rate units and nine affordable units. Of the 47 market rate units, there would be 40 two bedroom units, averaging a little over 1200 square feet each and seven one bedroom units, averaging about 850 square feet each. Of the nine affordable units, by statute, there would be two three bedroom units, five two bedroom units, and two one bedroom units. The plan also includes 102 covered and sheltered from site parking spaces and storage closets available for all of the renters. And lastly, the plan also includes both indoor and outdoor amenity space that would include fitness areas, club rooms, and other activity or relaxation gathering areas. So with that, I'd like to turn the podium over to Stuart Johnson. So quickly, uh, a little bit myself. My name is Stuart Johnson. I'm a principal of Minnewasco Architects and Planners. Um, it's an honor to be here in front of the council and members of the public this evening to present this uh, concept project. Um, so just to reiterate, uh, the subject property is approximately 1.5 acres. It fronts on Milburn Avenue uh, to the south, uh, uh, Douglas Street to the west, and Essex Street to the north, as well as Spring Street uh, to the east. Um, the prior use was the Wells Fargo Commercial Bank, as well as a sea of asphalt parking, uh, surface parking that supported that use. As you can see from the existing aerial site uh, image here, the site is almost 100% impervious coverage, uh, concrete, uh, limited sidewalk widths, and landscape. Um, there are a few images here on the right. Uh, the first image is a view looking northeast from the intersection of Milburn Avenue and Douglas. You can see the existing uh, two and a half story commercial bank property as as it exists today uh, the image in the middle is from milburn avenue and the third image is from the intersection of spring street and essex uh, if we advance to the next slide so we're pleased to present uh, this potential redevelopment project here located within the downtown it's a very unique site as uh, mr yeager had said previously the site steps a full story from north to south uh, the, the existing grade elevation at the intersection of Douglas and uh, Milburn Avenue is approximately elevation 129. It's approximately elevation 140 at the intersection of Douglas and, and, um, and Essex Street. So that goes up approximately 11 feet, so a full building story as, as uh, Douglas intersects uh, with Essex. Um, we propose a new multifamily community located within the downtown that would create a new gateway into town, create um, a prominent sense of architecture, um, a three-story building that provides a human scale at the uh, street level. It's a three-story building that steps to the massing of a two-story building as it wraps uh, the corner of Douglas to Essex. Uh, so as previously described, uh, it's two levels of residential over a level of parking. There are 102 internal structured parking spaces located at that first uh, level, uh, which is partially below grade um, as you move up, uh, as you move up uh, uh, Douglas Street. Um, at the intersection there is a new sort of public plaza and landscaping that's being proposed, uh, which may be um, not perceived from this perspective rendering, but the dimension from the curb to the front door is approximately 30 feet. So it's a great opportunity for new landscaping, a uh, combination of hardscape and landscape as, as what's being shown there. That could be an attractive area to really create a uh, pedestrian friendly corridor at that intersection and tie this area of uh, Milburn Avenue with the rest of the retail corridor. Uh, we would have storefront glazing uh, at that corner there for the boutique hotel style lobby of this building. 
there are three residential units that front on Milburn Avenue, which, which would each have a private brownstone stoop of 12 to 18 inches. And then as you march up um, uh, Douglas Street, you'll see uh, brownstone style stoops uh, to provide provi uh, private access for the residential units at the second floor as the grade uh, continues up there. So you'll see how those stoops are elevated approximately seven, six, uh, and five feet above grade there. Um, along Douglas, we have approximately 20 feet from the curb to the building face. So again, that's an opportunity for a four foot planting strip, uh, new street trees, a new six foot uh, sidewalk, and then approximately 10 or 11 feet of landscaping and buffer to the building versus the existing con uh, condition today, which is limited um, street trees and landscaping and a lot of asphalt. So if we advance the slide, uh, this is the ground floor level. So the area in yellow that's located at the intersection of Douglas and Milburn is the primary residential lobby, um, the main entrance to the building. The three boxes in orange immediately adjacent there are the three two-bedroom units I referenced that uh, front on Milburn Avenue would allow for that human scale architecture to wrap the corner and really activate that corner of the building and the streetscape. The area in light gray is the surface park or is the structured parking internal to the building that's screened from public view. And the darker area along the back side of the building are internal um, storage lockers, which would be an amenity for uh, the proposed residents here in the community. If you advance the slide to the next slide. Uh, this is the second level of the multifamily apartment building. Um, you'll see that it's a double loaded corridor building, a modified U shape. Uh, that opens onto an open courtyard. Um, that open courtyard is a generous sized courtyard that faces east to allow for light and air for those residential units. Uh, the, the amenities for this building are also located on this level. So um, the areas in pink there are a club room, uh, which would provide for uh, a natural gas fireplace, an area for residents to commune and, and uh, provide sort of a Super Bowl movement. There's a private event room or what we're calling a tasting kitchen that can be rented out uh, by uh, the building residents and the area in orange and purple provide for a state-of-the-art fitness center, spin, yoga, stretching, et cetera, with direct access to that outdoor courtyard. And as you can see in the outdoor courtyard, uh, we propose a series of passive and active outdoor recreations, uh, you know, such as barbecue grills and eating area for the 56 residential apartment units. Um, one point to note here is you can see uh, a conceptual uh, landscape plan at the streetscape. Uh, so if you look along Douglas or along Milburn Avenue, you'll see that four foot planting strip with the new street trees, the six foot sidewalk, and then 10 or 11 feet of landscape buffer uh, that extends to the building face. And along Douglas where we have those brownstone style stoops uh, that run parallel to the building to provide that human scale to the architecture. Uh, if we advance to the next slide, uh, these are just a couple of theme imagery uh, boards that, that show exemplary images for the internal amenities for the community. So the top left image is an example of the club room that I had referenced. Uh, the image on the top right being that sort of private event room or tasting kitchen that could be rented out. Uh, bottom left, another example of a club room with uh, floor to ceiling glass that looks onto that open courtyard. And lastly, at the bottom right-hand corner, uh, an example of a cardio and weight center, again, opening up and viewing onto that courtyard uh, with lots of glass. Uh, advance to the next slide. These are uh, more theme images of the active and passive outdoor recreation within the courtyard. So you see some barbecue grills, you see some turf areas, uh, some areas for lounging, some areas for grilling and entertaining. Advance to the next slide. This is the third level of the building, so uh, the second level of residential. So a double loaded corridor building, units are approximately 30 feet deep. Um, all the residential units in the building would have a minimum ceiling height of nine feet. Uh, typically li uh, living rooms have nine feet of glass and bedrooms have six feet of glass. So these apartment units allow for bright and, uh, bright and airy units with an open layout that provide for lots of light and air. If we advance to the next slide. Uh, th this is another theme image here, uh, just showing some of the typical interior finishes for the uh, master bedroom and bathroom and kitchen areas. So again, uh, these units would be an open floor plan with lots of glazing on the exterior to provide for a residential feel interior and exterior of the units. Um, and lastly, 
we advance the slide that brings us back to the perspective rendering. So again, a three-story building that has a three-story massing fronting on Milburn Avenue, uh, stepping to that of a two-story exterior building materials, uh, similar to that of what we find within the downtown masonry brick veneer, uh, manufactured cast stone, providing for a water table and precast sill details. As you can see, uh, we're providing that on the first floor and bringing that up into uh, the second floor of the building at the corner. Um, and lastly, you see that we're breaking this building up into a series of vertical and uh, horizontal articulated pieces uh, to, to, to break up the mass of that building to feel like a series of buildings. And I think that those brownstone stoops that uh, we conceptually show along Douglas uh, go a long way to provide a human scale at the base of the building. Um, so with that, that concludes my conceptual presentation. I'd be happy to answer any questions or, you know, if you'd like to. Go ahead. If I, if my notes are right, it was uh, 56 units and 102 parking spaces. Correct. Right, so that's fewer than, uh, and uh, the first presenter suggested that a lot of the uh, units would be, the target audience would be empty nesters in Milburn who want to stay, Milburn Short Hills who want to stay in Milburn Short Hills. Typically, it would have more than one car, right? Yep. So it'd be difficult for 56 units to have 102 spaces. So actually, no. There's 105 bedrooms. So when that's really how we often look at it. Although IS, uh, RSIS, which are the state statutes, which typically govern uh, in transit-oriented type communities, what parking ratios are, we actually think that 102 spaces is ample for 105 bedrooms because in all likelihood all of those 42 bedrooms are not going to have two cars and some of the one bedrooms may not have a car at all well so some of the one some of the bedrooms may have two cars you know husband, some of the I'm uh, sorry? Uh, a partner and a partner uh, in a one bedroom in a one bedroom or a two or a three they may yeah, have we we, yeah, we we would not encourage we would not look to and we don't find it common at least in our history that one bedroom uh, that one bedroom uh, units get I two cars? I wasn't explaining it right. Okay. If you have a three bedroom unit and you have a uh, husband, wife, and a couple of kids, that's two cars, right? Yes. Okay. Yeah, and, we, and I, that's factored into the 105 bedrooms. Right. So when I take into consideration the, the two bedrooms, and then we have two three bedroom affordable units because the statute will require that, right. no market rate, three bedrooms. So when, we, when I come up with, at least when I do the math, and I come up with 105 bedrooms, that's for the entire complex. So. I think our experience is we, we would not accommodate uh, guests and visitors on site. They would be expected to park. That was my next question. On, so on, 102, town, is, they do. 102 just fills the 56, but there's no overflow for anything else. Well, because we would envision the underbuilding parking to be secured. So we would there would be a key access, card key access through your key fob, which we think is an important part of the overall lifestyle that we would look to create. Where do the visitors park overnight? On I don't know about overnight. I assume Mil Milburn has parking ordinances that don't permit overnight parking correct so yes. like most towns they have to figure that out uh, at least that we've worked in so whether they can park in the city lots um, overnight on weekends or whether that's an arrangement that they can work out with so the that's town an accommodation you'll be requesting from the Milburn Township is to relax its overnight parking rules and define I, parking no for I would not because that's usually a resident issue the re if the residents have a guest who's going to be coming to visit and require overnight parking that's for them to deal with the town that's not typically a building management or a building ownership issue right. and if the police happen to say no that night then the resident calls a guest and says no you can't come so. yeah that's that's not a situation that I'm, I'm overly familiar with or that we've ever found to be troublesome thank you could you please yes. repeat the breakdown of the, uh, the the quantity of the units and the sizes? Yes, yeah, so of the total 56 units, mm -hmm. 47 market rate units, 9 affordables. Right. And of the 47 market rate units, 42 bedrooms, 7 one bedrooms. The two bedrooms would average a little over 1,200 square feet. And the one bedrooms would average about 850 square feet. And then of the nine affordable units, there would be two three bedrooms, five two bedrooms, and two one bedrooms. Any questions from us on the board? Well, I would like to say that I had the opportunity to meet with you, and I think this is a <coughs> terrific use. 
we had gone over a lot of different um, articulations of the plan, and I think that if the statute calls for that many parking spaces, you have fulfilled that statute. So that's not an issue. Um, you were very accommodating when we had suggestions. You know, a lot of streetscape, which is really important, the trees, blending it in with the rest of Milburn Avenue and Essex. I'd ask you, do people care about living by a fire station? You say no, that is something that people are fine with. So it really fits the bill. I agree when you say that there is no need to add more retail space on the ground level because it's just never going to be filled, it'll be empty. So I think it is better to have walking wallets, to have people in the community using our community, be it if they're using the trains, the parks, the restaurants. So I think you have really worked very hard to make this a good project for that space. So thank you. I, I do have one question. Thank you. What, what do you anticipate are your next steps? That's a very good question. Thank you. Because um, if we like this project, the reality is we couldn't build this project today. So. Um, I would envision us being anxious at this point, uh, given that the um, property owner has understood that this was going to be the condition in terms of the vacant building for quite some time and it now realistically looked that it's going to be probably vacant for a couple of years by the time we get through whatever it is that we've got to get through and hopefully be able to build something at some future date. So they're, they're anxious to, to move the process forward. Um, I believe there's a couple of ways that we can accomplish that, um, which would require some element of rezoning of the property, whether it be a rezone or a designation of an area in need of redevelopment. I think there's a couple of different mechanisms that can be uh, considered. So we're anxious to talk about what those next steps could be with this governing body as to how we could potentially and eventually would require engaging the planning board and other right. professionals within the township to, to see how we can do that. Thank you. Comments, questions? I'm just glad to start saying some residential by uh, TODs. I'm, I'm glad to see it starting to happen. I think it's important to, for our community. We, we do as well. We think it's a, it's a, it's a great site. There's been, um, like we say, we think it's a unique opportunity given the location Absolutely. and the, the size of the property. and. Given uh, what we know uh, all downtowns are challenged with, we think it's a great opportunity for the township. Yep. Right. Okay, so we will work on what the next steps are with town hall and planning board and see how we move this okay. at council. Right, Kit? Correct. And council, I left you, you out. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you for your time. Appreciate it. Um, do we take the okay. I'm ha happy to. Oh, if you're happy to, sure. Phil, please step up and state your name and address. <clears throat> Phil Kirsch, 93 Cedar Street. I don't really have an opinion about the project at the moment, just hearing about it, but I had a couple questions. I think a couple things occurred to me as you were speaking. Sure. Um, one was where is the entry for to that to the parking going to be from Essex Street? No. Entry and exit? Or? No, it would, it would be anticipated to be where the current, right about where the current curb cut is off of Milburn. That serv the services that the old drive-throughs, mm -hmm. it would be located right about there. There would be no other, no additional uh, entrance, vehicular entrance into the project off of Essex and Brothers. Only where the current cut is okay. off of Melbourne. And um, why nine uh, affordable housing units? Why that number exactly? Our assumption is while this the township continues to negotiate with Fair Share Housing Authority on their eventual affordable housing plan. What we have encountered is that in most municipalities, they are settling at a, what they call a 15% set aside. So for every 100 units, 15, every, every 100 market rate units, 15 affordable units have to be developed. So the nine is simply 15% of 56. Mm -hmm. So it's mathematical, which I, I, again, I think is what I'm anticipating the township may end up settling on with the state. If there were, if you could, manage to get more and still get the numbers you wanted to, when, would that help the town in the overall picture or do they go by, you know, development by development? You talk about in satisfying the affordable housing obligation? Yeah, if the township could sure. get five more out of that or sure. is that you something? Sure, do a six-story building or a seven-story <laughs> building and create more units. Well, it, it would eventually, yes, help the township's affordable housing obligation. 
but it's always a balance, right? It's a balance between correct size, the right density, the right massing, being able to park it appropriately. So I, it's, a, it's a balance. Um, I don't think you'd ever find a developer who would say, I'd like to do less than more, <laughs> but you, you, have to, you have to be sensitive in managing how that all works. So we, after going around and around, think we settled on the appropriate scale, the appropriate size without overly burdening or taxing either physically or operationally the site. So we, we think it's a good number. Okay, thanks. Thank you. Please. Judy Rosenthal, 12 Marion. It looks like a beautiful project, but my concern is the number of children coming into the school district um, and overburdening our already crowded schools and burdening the taxpayers with having to potentially build another school, expand another school. So my question is, would you consider making this an age-restricted development in order to um, foreclose the, the possibility of the rest of us having to take on the, the added tax burden of schools? That's one question. I, obviously, you don't have to give me an answer now. It's no, just, I'm just, just, I'm I'm just raising it. Sure, sure. And um, then the other thing is, in order to make the numbers work, what do you anticipate rents ranging from, from a one-bedroom to a three-bedroom? So it's very early, obviously. Mm -hmm. and, and my sense is that under the best-case scenario, we really probably wouldn't be in a position to actually start renting units for a couple of years. Zoning approvals. But let's just let's pretend so we wave so, a magic wand yeah. and boom, it's so, right there. Yeah, so I would I would think that one bedrooms would today, right? Not taking into yes. consideration right. two or three years from now. Today, uh, I believe one bedrooms would rent probably in the twenty five to twenty six hundred dollar a month range. And that would be with in parking included and sure. those types of things. Uh, two bedrooms, depending on size and location of the building, that's also obviously a, a factor and a criteria because it, it does vary. I think two bedrooms would probably range in the thirty-seven to thirty-eight hundred dollar a month range. Okay, thank you very much. Thank you. Okay. I, I'd also Wait. address to the extent I can the school. We're just going to cut. Yeah, we're going to try to keep it brief because we have sure. a big agenda tonight. Sure. So sure. it's just like okay. information. But go ahead. Sure. So, um, so your point is a very legitimate one, and it's, it's one that every town asks when you talk about multifamily projects. So, um, so I would prefer not to make it age-restricted because I think that limits your rental base very significantly. Um, I would be eligible. I love age-restricted <laughs> projects. In a situation like this, because I think there would be such market demand by a variety of younger, older, et cetera, I, I think it adds a certain uh, liveliness, a certain community to the building when you have buried, younger, older, and mixed. So my preference would be not to, Adrian. Um, we have found, and I, I th am anticipating that some will tell me that Milburn Short Hills is unique in this regard, is that you can often control the nature of your renter through your price point, your amenities, your finishes, your unit size, your unit mix. You can, you can control largely without being discriminatory. You can control to some extent how you yes. rent your building. Um, we have found a, a lot of success in communities like Summit and Madison and Westfield, which are all lovely in their own right, um, with the type of really what we would consider to be a very nicely amenitized, higher end type of a little boutique environment that's really not conducive to children, okay. honestly. Um, one other question. If, we're going to have to okay. speed okay. it up. I'm sorry. All right. Right. And one thing you did do, you, you took away the three bedrooms, which would have possibly had more children. So that was, that. right. Yeah, okay, so gorgeous. can we, yes. if you ask a question, please keep it very, very brief because. I have one question. Go ahead, please. Richard Wasserman, 24, Inverness Court. Um, are you concerned about the traffic flow? I mean, I know a lot of uh, residents in town are very concerned because coming around that bend, you kind of go into one lane. You know, talk about from Douglas to Melbourne. Yeah. Yes. 
So one of the things that was very important in that yeah. that we we did speak with uh, with the mayor about is that the building would be set back enough to try to improve sight lines as you make that term. Mm -hmm. And to the extent there are other improvements, if this development were to move forward at that intersection, that the township and or the county would feel would be helpful in improving the traffic flow situation there, we'd be happy to be a part of that discussion because it is a it is a challenging. And what adds to the challenge is that the fire department is at the top of the hill. Mm -hmm. So coming around that bend, you know, going to an emergency, I, I mean, I'm concerned about the traffic flow for the fire department to get through to Milburn Avenue. Mm -hmm. Right now, you know, on a bad day, it's hard enough for those fire engines to get through. Right. So I'm just, you know, just bringing that to your attention. It's, it's, it's legitimate because it's, it's an existing condition that we need to make sure that we do whatever we can to help make sure that it's improved and not... Exacerbated or, or Wonderful. Thank you so much. Thank you. Last question, please. Oh, okay. Both of you, and then we're going to move on to the business of the evening. Peter Leibson, 364 Wyoming. I have basically a combined question. Number okay. one, are you planning alternative forms of energy uh, to be used, for example, solar panels? And number two, will your garage, because it's important today, have plugs? Because uh, electric cars are the way of the future. Are you planning to have facilities for, for that? Yes. So our plan at the moment is not to do solar panels. We anticipate that this would be what is called an Energy Star building, not LEED certified, but does have things in terms of thermal pane windows, the proper kind of refraction, and to make the building as energy efficient as possible. We don't anticipate that we would probably use solar panels we do anticipate that we will have electric car charging station alternatives because, as you say, that is becoming a popular alternative today. Thank you. Thank you. I'd like to see a lease when you're ready. <laughs> <laughs> Get you on the waiting list. Hello. David Cosgrove, 99 Oakview. Uh, sir, how did you folks settle on 56 units? So, as I said before, it's, it's a little bit of uh, some art, some science, you know, looking at the buildings, looking at the site trying to figure out um, height, <coughs> unit mix, parking, grade, elevation change, all those types of things, try to come up with uh, the right number at the end of the day that we feel, again, from a, scale, a visual scale standpoint, is appropriate for the community in the neighborhood, and then from an operational and a functional standpoint, that it's not you know, too much, so that the, the, the site just can't function, whether it be from parking or circulation or whatever. So it's a bit of trial and error, and, and honestly, we started out, we were somewhat significantly higher than 56, but as we started to work with it and got a few comments from some of uh, the folks here in the room tonight, um, we started tweaking it and mixing it up and looking at it differently and ended up with 56. So there was really no magic to it. It was just kind of the result when we felt we had the right programming. Now, have you reached out to any of the neighbors on that, that side street, the single-family homes? Not at this point. We okay. felt it was most appropriate to get the concept plan out into the general public first. And then, as I think we talked with the township committee members and their professionals about how we advance the process that we were just speaking about, clearly we would engage not just the Douglas Street neighbors, but neighbors from a much wider range. And, and how, when you do that, how do you do that? So we typically find a community space and we send out notices. Well, we can get mailing lists from folks in the town from a notice perspective. Okay. And we try to give people as much notice as possible and we'll get people together at 7.30 on a Wednesday evening and gotcha. we'll go through these, these kinds of informational sessions and, and talk with everybody and try to hear their concerns and make sure we do everything we can okay. to address them. And, and it looks like there's a handout that the members have, of the committee members. Is that going to be we're, available to the we're public? We're going to leave a copy of the, just what you saw here today. I'll, I'll leave behind for the committee members. I don't know if that gets posted or how that beca if that becomes available for public dissemination, but the committee, the committee members will have a copy. Okay. Thank you very much. Absolutely. Thank you. Thank you for Thank joining you very much us this evening. Okay. Very much appreciate it. Appreciate Thank it. You. Thank you. Okay. <clears throat> public comment. When invited to speak, please come to the lectern, clearly state your name and address, speak into the podium microphone so that your comments can be understood by all and properly recorded. Whenever an audience or committee member reads from a prepared statement, please give or email a copy to the township clerk's office at cgatti at milburntwp.org. 
To help facilitate an orderly meeting and to permit all to be heard, speakers are asked to limit their comments to three minutes. And there's a count-up clock here. And um, please go ahead with our first commenter. Hi, good evening. Hi. Um, Phoebe Shear, 101 Oak View Terrace. Uh, I'll just be really brief because uh, I I'm commenting on the report on the mediation on the Woodland Project. And, and I believe that um, our attorney and the township committee knows that what's upsetting those of us who came here uh, to tell you about this uh, post on the Silverman site was not that confidentiality was broken. Of course, we, we don't, we, we have no, we wish there weren't any confidentiality. To us, it's just a way of keeping the public in the dark so that the project can be announced as a fait accompli and we'll have less to say about it. We're concerned about, just, just to make clear, what we're concerned about is what was on the site, which was exactly what Silverman um, had put on the site a couple of years ago or a year and a half ago. And uh, from our point of view, that's, that's completely unacceptable. Um, I don't really have an opinion on the project presented tonight, but I will say it's less units than the one that was advertised on that site with no Summit Medical Group and less parking units and more setbacks. Um, I, I don't know that we'd say, oh, let's have that. It's the same size lot, about the same size lot. Let's just move that over. I, I, I'm not sure that, that, that that's uh, the perfect plan. Um, but it certainly is not as bad as what, the, um, as what Silverman has has put up on his site and apparently, confidentiality or not, believes it's going to get. So, um, uh, that, so I just wanted to basically clarify that point that uh, whereas the committee may be concerned about keeping this confidential, we're concerned about the substance of what was on the site and that's nothing better than we had at the start and we were hoping for something better. Thank you. Hi, thank you. Uh, I'm Sean McQueeny, uh, 11 Pine Terrace East in the Glenwood section. Uh, <clears throat> excuse me. My wife, Rosemary, and I uh, are here tonight to voice strong support uh, in favor of the 2019 referendum uh, introduced in the last committee meeting uh, related to uh, marijuana legislation. Um, our view is allowing retail and wholesale marijuana operations in Milburn poses a very serious threat to public safety and the health and well-being of the community. As such, residents should have every reasonable opportunity to voice their opinions uh, and shape the forward impact on our community. We are just starting to learn now about uh, the impacts of legalization in early adopter states such as Colorado, and in particular, the impact on adolescents and teenagers in those communities. Uh, to share one of many examples, uh, a Washington Post article this week uh, cited a nearly 400% increase in marijuana-related emergency room visits in children's hospitals across the state of Colorado, covering a range of conditions uh, from overdoses on high-potency high products in the market to mental health issues such as uh, psychosis, paranoia, depression, uh, and attempted suicide. Uh, the safety and welfare and, and well-being of our children is the first uh, and, and top priority um, for all of us and must come first. No amount of revenue should justify compromising that core principle. Uh, and we also should not estimate the levels of resources and cost and manpower that would be required to monitor police uh, and service a, a functioning marijuana industry uh, in the township. Um, we heard our mayor talk earlier today about what a great town we have uh, and, and, and the terrific people we have and, and all that there is to be proud of. We want to see the township stay that way. We do not want to see marijuana dispensaries or open public recreational use uh, in the township, period. On the question of, of timing that I think was raised, um, we think waiting until 2020 to start the process and start soliciting public opinion um, is frankly, in our opinion, irresponsible. Um, it's unclear what the opt-out period will be uh, if there's a referendum and it moves forward in 2020 at a statewide level. 
Um, it's unclear whether there will be a 180 day period or something completely different. Uh, and even if there were, it's unclear what process and procedural and other hurdles um, could, could come along the way uh, in terms of whatever our response ends up being um, as a township. Many New Jersey towns um, have been looking closely at this and engaging with the public as early as 2019. Many of the 2017, excuse me. Um, many of those towns have subsequently taken proactive steps, including, uh, in some case, in many cases, uh, introducing ordinances uh, again in a proactive manner. Um, so our view is a non-binding referendum in 2019 is a small step, but frankly, a very prudent one to to. Uh, start the process and, and engage further with the public. Um, it's this committee's responsibility to ensure our town is well positioned and well prepared to act. Um, and so uh, with that in mind, we ask the committee to not delay to start the process now um, and move forward with a 2019 referendum to make sure the parents and residents uh, have a voice in this important matter. So thank you for your time. Thank you. We will be discussing this under old business. We have a few ordinances to go through, but I really appreciate your coming up. Sorry if I went out of order, by no, the way. No, no, there's no order. This is public comment, Great. and I appreciate you speaking. Thank you. Thank you. Hi. Hi, good evening. Jennifer Wilson, 11 Norwood Terrace. Um, I've been a homeowner in this town, the same house, for 15 years. Um, about two years ago, somebody bought the property next door and has been running an Airbnb um, for two years. The nightly Airbnb, not the kind where people stay for you know, long term. Um, I have three children. They peer out the window every week, see who's coming with suitcases up the street. Um, I, I'm not going to say all of the tenants have been terrible, but you don't know what you're going to get. Um, this weekend, it came to a head. There was a group of individuals um, she has a rule that there's only supposed to be five. She has a rule that there's only not supposed to be parties, but she lives out of town, out of state. She's not paying attention to what they're doing. Um, I had to call the police twice. Once they had about 20 cars screaming, yelling on a school night. My son's window is right, you know, facing the street. He was not only, you know, couldn't sleep, but was scared. I mean, there was screaming, there was loud music. And when it's a neighbor, you can go over and say, you know, do you mind putting your music down? Do you mind it's late? Or if a dog's barking, and you know, you have a relationship. But we don't know these people. We don't know who they are, how safe they are to go. They're going to start a fight with us if we go out. So we called the police. Police came Saturday morning, or maybe it was Sunday morning, 6:30 in the morning, having a fight outside, not a fist fight, screaming fight at 6:30 in the morning on a, on a Saturday morning. Called the cops again. They actually ignored the cops. Fast forward, the cops finally spoke to them. They left the door to the house wide open, flies, bugs. I had, my husband said, should we go in there? I said, I don't know if there's anybody in there. I'm not going in there. We finally reached the homeowner who is very nice. You know, she's a nice woman, was appalled. We went over there. They trashed the house, garbage everywhere. This is ridiculous. This, I can't even believe that this is legal. I mean, people, most of the people in this town don't believe it is legal, but apparently it is. It's, it's, it, it's, it's just not right to have people with, you have no idea who they are, you have no idea, one person gives their name and their credit card, but 20 people are staying there. I, I believe there was illegal activity happening in that house. The police are actually investigating as we speak, but that's only one story. The stories go on and on by the day. And I am not opposed to long-term rentals. I'm not opposed to rentals when the homeowner is there and monitoring, but these kind of rentals have to stop. And I know that there's been talk and, or, and talk of ordinances. I'm not sure where we are with all that. I'm a very busy working mom of, with three children, so I don't, I'm not up on that. But after this weekend, I owe it to the community and my family to, to let have this practice stop. I don't see the benefit. I know that for the benefit to her is, is the income, but it's not worth the safety and the, 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 the lack of integrity of a community. And the police actually said to me and my husband, if this were my neighborhood, I would leave, I would move. Do you really want that? Your, your, your neighbors and your, everybody having to leave because of feeling unsafe with people you know, next door to them? It's, it's, I had a whole talk with the homeowner and she claims she's thinking of even stopping, but I, I can't wait for that to happen. So thank you. So I would just like to address um, comment 
we did bring this up before the committee. We didn't have consensus because it was, some of us felt, some felt that you should not restrict. Some of us felt if it could be while the homeowner's in the home. And I think the committee will talk about it again at another date. We'll put it on the agenda and see where we can move on this because that situation is untenable. It's so. And that's only one of, of that's course. one. There's right. other stories I could tell you throughout the years, but that was the, the right. one that brought me to say I can't, I can't wait any longer and, and let it go on without speaking my mind. Well, so. I appreciate you coming before thank us. You. And you, we got an email from you, so thank you for taking the time and thank coming you. out here. Hi, Peter Leapson. I'm still at 364 Wyoming <laughs> Avenue. That's because that's not built yet. I actually have two issues. One, um, and it's very serious because it's been going on uh, through next door Milburn. We've been getting all of these notifications about a, an extermination company that has been roaming the neighborhoods and knocking on people's doors and soliciting business. Um, and I've also been told that People who want to solicit business have to go to the town and get a, a license or a pay a fee. I'm trying to understand what right the town has to legislate a person's right to trespass on my property. This is my property. I, I can understand if it's a political issue where you have candidates running for office, where you're trying to get out the right to vote, or you are petitioning for a change. But to you have no right to allow somebody on my property who's soliciting. And, if, would you allow the attorney to speak to that? Kit, would yeah. you please? But come to the microphone. So. Yeah, this, this uh, particular company is well known throughout the country for having successfully sued municipalities for infringing upon their <clears throat> right to exercise commercial free speech at school. Um, these kinds of solicitations <clears throat> are effectively stopped through the methodology that the Township Committee has adopted in a recent ordinance providing for a non-solicitation list, which you can get on, and putting a, a sticker on your door that you're uh, no knock, you're not interested, go away, don't want to talk to you, uh, which uh, is effective and legal. There, there is no reason for you to be disturbed in your home if you don't want to be. The township, the way that you've characterized it is that we've somehow, as a township, permitted people to come onto your property. The fact is that the right of people to solicit for various reasons, not only for voting, but to, you know, the old Fuller Brush Man or people who want to sell you uh, termite extermination services, whatever, it is a right that is protected. But as I said, there's an absolutely effective way for you to stop it from occurring. If you get on that list, when this outfit comes in to take out a permit, which they must do, they're given that list, these are the houses you can't go to. And they, if they fail to obey that, then they're subject to being fined. I still think that requiring me to put my name on a list and put something on my door now they're going to come up to the door, so they're already trespassing because they're walking on my property to come to the door. I think that, in a sense, I have a constitutional issue that it's an unlawful taking. It's an unlawful, because you're, somehow or other, this town is tr trespassing on my right to prevent trespassers. It's my property. I don't have to come to the town and say to the town, well, I'm going to put my name on a list, I'm going to put something on the door. Uh, we should not have to have to do that. Uh, you know, I mean... And I, I think that we have a right <clears throat> to prevent an unlawful taking, and I have a constitutional issue with that. Well, I, you know, I don't know whether you're really expressing, like, a Fifth Amendment taking or something. It's not an unlawful taking as a matter of law. Unfortunately for you, and, and there aren't too many people who think differently than you, the courts have spoken again and again on this. The federal courts... The U.S. Supreme Court, the appellate courts, about the right of people to come and register with the town and then proceed to go around and uh, sell a product or pass out literature on some particular cause that they think is important or urge you to vote for them if there's an election going on. There's a whole line of cases, and I can assure you 
but we looked at this very carefully and we have legislated right up to the water's edge on this through the provision of these methods which have been approved by the courts as a way to prevent these solicitors from visiting you at your property. Uh, that's all I can say. What the township is doing is in accordance with the law. Towns that, that have not, and there are many in New Jersey, have been taken to federal court and have been fined hundreds of thousands of dollars for what is characterized as an infringement upon the right of people to uh, so go to door to door and, and solicit for these various reasons. I, I get your point. I understand your point of view, but I have to assure you that we have done everything that a municipality can do to protect the homeowners through those methodologies. Can I indulge you with the other issue? Because it's important too. Please. I am going to personalize this, but I know that this has happened in this town primarily during the time of the recession. I'm an next door neighbor lives in this house that was pretty dilapidated when he bought it and he decided to renovate and he went through the process of getting the proper uh, permits and nine years later because he was doing it himself he hadn't finished it uh, I call a house a very famous church called Our Lady of Perpetual Construction because this house had Tyvek for six years. I think that, and now that they finished that project, they're into another project, also self-help. He's doing it himself when he has time. I think there should be a regulation in this town that any work done on the exterior of a house, because right now, by the way, he does not have a dumpster, so I can't begin to tell you what his side yard looks like. You might be able to see pictures of it if you go down the south and see some of the shanty towns because that's what this area has become. This town should require completion bonds for any work done outside because by working outside, you're affecting my property, the values to my property, and I'm asking that you take this up requiring completion bonds because if they had a completion bond, it wouldn't be, there wouldn't be construction lasting for nine years because you'd call a bond in. Is that something that we can look at? Is that something that is legal? I d I've never heard uh, of that. Uh, neither have I actually, but we can, we can, uh, I mean, certainly. Can we just look into it? Yeah. This That's problem it. happened during the recession when people ran out of money. Sure. If they ran out of money and they had a completion bond, the property would have been completed. I'll have the building department look into that because we don't have the answer. But thank you for bringing that to our attention. Thank you. I hope it exists. Thank you. Thank you. Okay. And I'll still remain at 364 White. <laughs> okay. Hi, I'm Judy Rosenthal, 12 Marion Avenue. Uh, first of all, real quick, I want to thank you guys for the banners that you did for Memorial Day. It was terrific. I thought that was a great way to honor our veterans. Thank you. I can't thank you enough for doing that. Um, Number two, I know that the Township Environmental Committee is considering um, targeting plastic, single-use plastic mm -hmm. items. And I'm going to leave this with the town clerk. I just want to read a couple of excerpts. This is in the New York Times. This one town in Canada was trying to limit single-use plastic bags. So what they did is, or I'm sorry, this one store in Canada. So they had printed, actually I guess it was a couple stores, on their plastic bags they had things like into the weird adult video emporium <laughs> and other plastic bags that said the colon care co-op these were not the names of the stores mm -hmm. they just figured that people wouldn't want to you know carry around a plastic bag making it seem like they just came from getting their colon looked at <laughs> p.s it didn't work everyone thought it was cute and funny and mm -hmm. we want one of those bags so milburn <laughs> don't use that but I, I do fully support the single-use plastic ban. A couple of interesting factoids. Um, more than 40 countries have banned single-use plastic. If countries can, can ban it, why can't Melbourne? Okay, so is all of California and it's under consideration in, in New York. Now, that argument might not persuade a segment of our co population, but this may. I'm just going to read this real quick. Plastic waste, waste has become so prevalent that tales of dead whales found on, 
found with pounds of plastic trash, including shopping bags in their stomachs, have become commonplace. In April, a, pregn a pregnant whale washed ashore in Italy with more than 48 pounds of plastic inside the animal. Humans, too, are ingesting plastic, but on a microscopic level. Um, a study released this week from Australia's University of Newcastle, commissioned by the World Wildlife Fund, found that each week, people could be consuming approximately the weight of a credit card, or about 2,000 tiny pieces of plastic, mainly through water cont containing microplastics. Micro so I'm gonna leave this with um, Ms. Gatti, Please. and if you guys could perhaps use some of these arguments to persuade the more reluctant members of our population. Thank you. Thank May you. I approach? Please. Thank you. Thank you. So the Environmental Commission is working on finishing their resolution. When they pass it, they will be bringing it before this board, and this board then has to vote on it. Okay. Okay? All right. Stay tuned. Okay, thanks. Thanks. Good evening. I'm Stephanie Malios from Melbourne Township. Uh, my first comment is I want to thank all of you for serving on the Township Committee. I know oh, it's a address. lot of... Address. I'm sorry, Stephanie. Oh, I'm sorry. 86 Whitney Road. Thank you. I know it's a lot of work and I commend you and I thank you for taking the mantle of trying to forward Milburn into um, where it needs to go and, and taking the responsibilities. It's a hard job and I'm grateful that you're all doing it. Um, my first comment is on single room only hotels, which is what I call Airbnb and other short term rentals. When I lived in Manhattan, that's what they called those crappy streets that you didn't want to live on because you never knew who was coming and going. Usually they were drug dealers or drug takers, and that's not why anybody moved to Milburn Township. There are zoning laws and zoning requirements, and I would venture to say that nobody who sits on the Township Committee would want a single room only hotel next to their own personal residence, nor do any of us. So I'm a parent. I don't want strangers living next to me every week, a different stranger coming in. It's terrifying. And I do hope that you have the courage to do something about it. I have no problem with people renting out their houses. I, you know, it's a free country, but on a daily basis, on a weekly basis, even on a monthly basis, there's something wrong with that picture. Something uh, is not sitting right with any of us. And anyone that I've spoken to who is not comfortable with speaking here in, in person, unfortunately, um, they're afraid because they know some of the people running these Airbnbs or Craigslist or whatever it is. But I can tell you that there's zero oversight on who's actually coming in. And uh, Megan's law doesn't apply. When I, I'm a realtor and when I write a lease, there's a provision on the lease, there's a provision on a contract of sale. Megan's Law, do you know of any sex offenders in the area? If you're doing an Airbnb or a Craigslist or one of the other ways of obtaining tenants in your house, you don't have to answer that. And that's extremely concerning. And um, I hope that you will look at this carefully and see if there's something that can be done to protect our children and, and our residents and our property values. Uh, another comment that I would like to make regarding the new proposal at Wells Fargo, it looks like a very attractive proposition, and to echo somebody else who spoke, why are they proposing less units there than the development on Woodland and Chatham Road on the edge of uh, a nature preserve and a block from an elementary school? Um, there has to be some sort of idea on what we want as a community. It's called a master plan, and I don't believe either one of these fits into our master plan, but the reality is that we have a, an issue with affordable housing. Can we get in front of it and possibly uh, allow affordable housing to people who already live here, people who are municipal workers, policemen, firemen, teachers, other people who are coming? You know, most of the teachers don't live here because they can't afford to, so they drive hours to get to work. Wouldn't it be great if they could have affordable housing where they could walk to their schools? Just a suggestion. It has been done. The Morris States and Morris Township was one in which their lottery for the affordable housing portion of the development there was limited to people who are already working in town in civil service uh, capacities. Um, my last point is uh, the marijuana referendum. 
why wouldn't we want to know what our community thinks about having marijuana produced, distributed, um, advertised in our township? I, as a parent, personally, <coughs> I'm finding it difficult to explain to my child why I tell him, no, you can't smoke marijuana, but yeah, we're gonna have a dispensary right here in the middle of town. I, it, it makes every parent's job incredibly difficult, but beyond my personal opinion of yes or no, to get the, take the temperature of the residents so that we can, you can represent the residents who elected you, I think that's your fiduciary responsibility and I urge you to have this referendum on the ballot as soon as possible. Thank you. Thank you. Anybody else? Okay, closing public comment. Okay. Oh, the agenda. The committee will now consider consent agenda resolutions. The resolutions listed on the consent agenda for consideration are as follows. The bills list, authorized refund of tax overpayments, authorized refund of tax overpayments, designate a parking utility bond anticipation note, confirm the appointment of DPW superintendent, and that would be James DeStano, who is being promoted, authorize the purchase of AT&T GSM LTE modem kits from Sourcewell National Co-op, approval of items of revenue and appropriation for the Clean Communities Grant, Award professional service agreement for a professional engineering design, services for rehabilitation of the Slayton pump station, and renewal of several liquor licenses in town. They just paid to renew their license for the year. Are there any comments from the committee or public in regards to any items listed on the consent agenda? Please. Consent agenda only. Right. Phil Kerr, still in 93 City Street. <laughs> Um, I did have a question about resolution 19-150. I understand that bond anticipation notes are preliminary, but this four million dollars, uh, four million one hundred eighty-eight thousand dollars parking utility. What would the bond be for if it if we eventually get a bond? Alex, can you please address that? Sure. Um, <clears throat> so this bond originates from the construction of the parking deck. Um, and bond anticipation notes are, are a financing method that the note is sold each year. So this is the sale of that note for 2019-2020. Um, so you can do that for up to 10 years. Um, and as rates are favorable, it's a good method. Um, for instance, in this case, we, we got 1.5%, where in the last note that we sold, we had 2%. So we've already seen a slight reduction in the bond interest rate. Um, but when rates start to get unfavorable, that's when you go out to bonds, not bond anticipation notes, and then you would, uh, or you could go out to bonds and have long-term financing of your projects. But this is this is a bond anticipation note. So this debt. is from the existing parking garage? Correct. Construction. Okay. And when do we anticipate this being paid off? Uh, 2022. Okay. Thanks. Okay, thank you. May I have a motion to approve the resolutions listed on the consent agenda? So moved. May I have a second? Second. May we have a roll call? Ms. Bursky? Yes. Mr. Levy? Yes. Ms. Lieberberg? Yes. Ms. Purpose? Yes. Maricel Egler? Yes. Thank you. Tara is scheduled to sponsor Ordinance 2532-19, please. I present for consideration an ordinance entitled Ordinance Number 2532-19, an ordinance <coughs> amending Chapter 2, Article 5 of the Revised General Ordinances of the Township of Milburn to create a Pedestrian Safety Advisory Board. This ordinance is designed to create a nine-member pedestrian safety advisory board to advise township committee on issues affecting pedestrian safety consistent with the traffic issues management policy adopted by resolution 19-079 and as amended from time to time. The township committee representative and the township resident members of the board will serve on a voluntary basis for the terms of three years. The board, which shall meet at least quarterly, will investigate and analyze pedestrian safety issues and present recommendations regarding new initiatives and policies. Tonight is the time set for public hearing and final passage as advertised in accordance with the law. I declare the hearing open. Would anybody like to comment? Go ahead, Tara. 
I move that this public hearing be closed and the ordinance be adopted on final reading and that the township clerk be directed to publish the ordinance by title as passed on final reading in accordance with the law. May I have a second? Second. Roll call. Ms. Burstein? Yes. Mr. Levy? No. Ms. Lieberberg? Yes. Ms. Purvis? Yes. Mary Jo Eglo? Yes. I would like to um, ask that this gets put on the list for um, volunteer interest forms so people will give them a couple of weeks if we could put this on the township website, let people know they can start sending in some um, volunteer interest forms. We have three positions that need to be filled. And then we will interview them as a township committee and make a decision. Okay. I am next. I am sponsoring Ordinance 2533-19. This is for a capital ordinance of Township of Milburn in the County of Essex, New Jersey, authorizing the making of various public improvements and acquisitions in and by for the township, appropriating there for the sum of $1,894,000 and providing that such sums so appropriate should be raised from the capital improvement fund of the township. Um, wait, 33. So, this includes a lot. It has under the fire department acquisition of new fire apparatus, equipment, automotive vehicle, and portable radios. $602,000. Department of Public Works, also equipment, front end loader, um, apparatus and equipment, and a forester vehicle, $185,000. For recreation, resurfacing of basketball courts, courts of Giro Park, $37,000. General building improvements for various public buildings, $100,000. Engineering, a few things in here, resurfacing, seal coating, micro paving of various roads throughout the township, $500,000. Police Department acquisition of new communication and just of portable radios, $70,000. Engineering undertaking the Short Hills Garden Drainage Improvement Project, $400,000. This is something that has to be done because that whole, uh, what do you call that? Flume. Flume can collapse, which would be a travesty. <sighs> Seward's? There's there a sewer line that, that yeah. runs next to that street. So that would be really bad. Uh, tonight is the time set for the public hearing and final passage is advertised in accordance with law. I declare the hearing open. Um, I just want to make a comment on under the fire department. There's a lot of things in here. Um, and I think, you know, in the future when we do this, we are going to have to pull out items for more, um, uh, more de detailed explanation because, you know, sometimes we pass these bills and there are a huge amount of dollars and things can get put in there that maybe the township committee people aren't aware of what we're actually voting on, which is, yeah. We can certainly provide more specifics. Absolutely. It has to be in the future. Very specific. So, um, tonight is the time set for public hearing and final passage, according with law. Open. Can I have a second? Second. Roll call. Ms. Burstein? Yes. Mr. Levy? Yes. Ms. Lieberberg? <coughs> yes. Ms. Purpose? Yes. Marathon Eglo? Abstain. Cheryl, 2534-19, please. I present for consideration an ordinance entitled Ordinance Number 2534-19. Bond ordinance to authorize the making of various public improvements in by and for the Township of Milburn in the County of Essex, State of New Jersey, to appropriate the sum of $1,614,000 to pay the cost thereof to make a down payment to authorize the issuance of bonds to finance such appropriation and to provide for the issuance of bond anticipation notes in anticipation of the issuance of such bonds. So these are improvement projects that need to be done that are going to be, uh, I guess, bans are going to be issued rather than coming out of our capital um, finance, right? So the improvements here are uh, supplemental funding for the undertaking of improvements to the Slayton Sanitary Sewer Pump Station, and that um, <coughs> is for $850,000. Supplemental funding for the undertaking of HVAC system upgrades at police headquarters, and that's $500,000. And reconstruction of Mountain View Road, Phase 2 from Whittingham Terrace to Wyoming Avenue, 
and this that's two hundred and sixty four thousand dollars tonight is the time set for the public hearing and final passage as advertised in accordance with law may I have a second I have, uh, oh I'm sorry I declare the hearing open anybody comments questions I move that this public hearing be closed and the ordinance be adopted on final reading and that the township clerk be directed to publish the ordinance by title as passed on final reading in accordance with the law. May I have a second? Second. Roll call, please. Ms. Burstein? Yes. Mr. Levy? Yes. Ms. Lieberberg? Yes. Ms. Krupis? Yes. Mary Thurman? Yes. Jackie, 2535-19, please. This is an ordinance to amend and supplement the revised general ordinances of the Township of Milburn, Chapter 4, Subsection 4-39, entitled Vehicle Towing and Storage Services. The purpose of this ordinance is to revise the towing rates so they are in line with surrounding municipalities and fees set forth by the state, New Jersey State Police, as well as the clarifying language to several subsections of the ordinance. Tonight is the time set for the public hearing and final passage as advertised in accordance with law. I declare the hearing open. Any comments, questions? I move. Sponsor. I move that this public hearing be closed and the <coughs> ordinance be adopted on final reading and the township clerk be directed to publish the ordinance by title as passed on final reading in accordance with law. Do I have a second? Second. second. Roll call, please. Ms. Burstein? Yes. Mr. Levy? Yes. Ms. Lieberberg? Yes. Ms. Purpose? Yes. Mary Bell Yes. Thank you. Sam, 2536, please. This so ordinance authorizes the execution of a lease between uh, Milburn Township and the Recreation Commission vis a vis Milburn Youth Short Hill, Milburn Short Hills Youth Baseball. As we described last meeting, uh, Milburn traditionally enters into 10-year lease agreements with Milburn Short Hills Youth Baseball. This is a renewal of the existing lease agreement for 10 years, taking us to 2029 20, at a $1 per year lease term. Tonight is the time set for the public hearing and final pass is advertised in accordance with law. Tonight, do I say that? You want to declare the hearing open? I do. I, I want to declare all these hearings open. I declare the hearing open. Any questions, comments? Okay. Seeing none, I move that this public hearing be closed. New ordinance be adopted on final reading and the township clerk be directed to publish the ordinance by title. It's passed on final reading and in accordance with law. May I have a second? Second. Roll call. Ms. Burstein? Yes. Mr. Levy? Yes. Ms. Liebelberg? Yes. Ms. Lucas? Yes. Mayor Agla? Yes. Thank you. I am going to introduce ordinance 2537. This ordinance amends and supplements the Township of Milburn Development Regulations and Zoning Ordinance. The purpose of this ordinance is to amend use definitions, site plan exemption, height and parking requirements of the zoning codes of the Township's business districts. These changes follow similar recommendations made in the 2018 Master Plan Revision performed by the Milburn Township Planning Board. And this goal is to allow prospective businesses and merchants a less cumbersome and difficult process when coming before the planning board and board of adjustments. And this has been, we met with property owners, we got some ideas, the zoning officer, the, our planner, and we came up with a lot of really good recommendations that we had some questions at the last meeting and I think they've been clarified for all of our members. So I, declare the hearing open no I move that this ordinance be taken up and passed in first reading and the township clerk be authorized to have the ordinance published in accordance with the law in the item and for hearing on final passage on Tuesday August 13th 2019 where we will have Paul Phillips our planner here to clarify and go over any specifics so may I have a second second roll call Ms. Burstein? Yes. Mr. Levy? Yes. Ms. Lieberberg? Yes. Ms. Purpose? Yes. Mary Phil Eggle? Yes. Thank you. Tara, 2538, please. I'd like to present an ordinance entitled 
2538-19 an ordinance to amend and supplement the revised general ordinances of the Township of Milburn Chapter 2 uh, right, um, subscription subsection 2 entitled off-duty employment of police officers for police related activities the purpose of this ordinance is to revive rise language in the Township of Milburn's police off-duty ordinance that allows contractors to cancel jobs in a manner that does not allow sufficient time to notify officers working those jobs this ordinance will create a buffer between cancelization of a job and require notification to officers, a four minimum penalty for work canceled less than two hours before the job start. All right, I move that this ordinance be taken up and passed on first reading and that the township clerk be authorized to have the ordinance published in accordance with the law in the item and for hearing and final passage on Tuesday, July 16th. Second. Roll call. Ms. Burstein? Yes. Mr. Levy? Yes. Ms. Liebeberg? Yes. Ms. Brookes? Yes. Marika Eggle? Yes. Thank you. Okay. Moving on to old business. It's the non-binding <coughs> referendum of marijuana legislation. And I will pass it off to Jackie to start, please. As discussed previously, I strongly believe that a non-binding referendum regarding recreational marijuana should be on the ballot in 2019. I've received numerous emails from residents but that believe it is a good idea and would welcome the opportunity to weigh in on their thoughts. It will enable the township committee and the community to get a pulse on how our residents ages 18 and up feel about it in the township. We can gauge the community with a simple question. It is no real cost to us and allows us in a comprehensive way to see how we people feel. If the statewide initiative is on the ballot in 2020, we think so, but we have no conclusive evidence for certainty, it would allow us to have some data in advance on, the, on this New Jersey ballot initiative. I do not see any negative reason why we would not want to be positive engaging our constituents I think we should be proactive and I see no benefit in kicking the can down the road what I also would like to say is that um, initially the question was drafted and it was four parts and it separated uh, production distribution processing as well as retailing and I think the question should be just very very simple on the ballot as a resident of Milburn Township do you think the township should allow retail growing processing and or wholesale distribution of recreational marijuana facilities to operate within the township limits yes or no I think this will give us an accurate gauge in terms of how our residents feel and will enable us going forward to make appropriate decisions for our constituents um. Anybody on the committee would like to speak? Sure, I'll speak. I mean, I stated last time this A referendum is premature at this time. Nobody knows what the referendum will be in the state of New Jersey, what the legislation will be in the state of New Jersey, if any, or what the limitations will be in the state of New Jersey, if any, particularly with regard to communities' ability to opt out. There's been some comments that uh, having a retail or grow facility in New Jer in uh, Milburn will cause our youth or residents to uh, uh, have an increased likelihood of having hospitalization attributed to cannabis use. That can't possibly be true because the in any increased <coughs> hospitalizations or medical issues related to cannabis use are regardless of whether there's a grow or processing facility or retail facility in Milburn, because if it becomes the law that rec use is authorized for persons 21 years or older, then those persons can go to a place to get uh, cannabis and take it back to Milburn and smoke it in accordance with law. So it's irrelevant where they actually go. Now there's some who will say, well, they're more likely to go to a, a retail facility in Milburn than they would say in Springfield or something like that. The data in the uh, states and communities that have cannabis do not support that. Also, Jackie, to the extent that I was uh, considering a referendum two years from now, which I probably wouldn't oppose if I was on the committee then, it would have to be 
the breakdown that was previously presented to us of these different issues. So your question is, as a resident of Milburn Township, well, that's redundant because you can only vote in our referendum if you are a Milburn Township resident. But do you think that the township should allow, allow is not the issue, it's whether you opt in or opt out. And that's presently based on what New Jersey is thinking. So New Jersey, uh, Milburn doesn't have the ability not to allow it. Uh, but the real issue is you combine retail, growing, processing, and wholesale. So what if I, as a voting resident, thought that Milburn perhaps shouldn't allow for growing, opt out of growing or processing, but I was okay with retail? Or what if I thought that wholesale was okay because it's out of sight, uh, or processing was out of sight, but I was against retail? I wouldn't know how to answer this question. I'd probably have to select no. So it's bad, a bad question results in bad data. So to the extent that you're trying to get the pulse of the community at this early stage, pre-New uh, Jersey referendum and pre-New Jersey legislation at this very early stage, the extent that that's the pulse that you want to get, you're not going to get it from this question. It is inherent, the responses to this referendum question are inherently unreliable. So it serves no utility to have it, to burden our residents with a question they can't possibly provide any utility to a township committee considering it, particularly two years from now. So Sam, last meeting you didn't like the questions when they were sparsed out. So you don't no. like them in any way. You don't want to take the, what you're saying is no, that that's a not what I said. So let's, <laughs> let me ask. We could do it one of two ways. If you're interested in getting the opinion of the residents at a time when a lot of people will be going to the polls, it does not cost us anything. The, it gets on the ballot and it gets tallied. We can do one combined question, which gives you kind of a feel, or we can do four separate questions. Or you want to What's do... What's the question to me? The question to you is you want to do no questions. You at this point feel it is not important to even get a preliminary <coughs> feeling of how our residents feel on this. Well, I can't... Uh, that, that's a, a loaded question without no, a proper answer because I can't get a preliminary feeling from uh, the population because this question A is not framed right uh, and B if I if I was wondering based on this question mm -hmm. what does a township those who went out to vote think about retail I couldn't possibly know because no matter what the yes or no divide is I don't know if they're voting for growing or processing or wholesale or retail or all of them I just can't possibly know what it is. So if we sat here and debated legislation three years from now, which is what it would be on, on, on an opt-out, no, if that's what it is. If I was sitting here and debating that saying, well, what's the, what does the community think about this? I couldn't factor that into to my decision making. But, but what makes you think it's three years? It could, be, it could be as early as next year. It could be as early as 2020. If it's on the ballot in 2020. No, no. The, referend the New Jersey referendum is in 2020. And Correct. so the earliest the legislation could hit would be the second uh, voting cycle of 2021, which effectively renders it for 2022. So you're, I, I don't know how much the community turns over in those two or three years, but that's another factor about how reliable this data is. The point is, is that the then township committee, when considering whether it even has the option to opt out, which nobody knows, but assuming that it does, it has the option to opt out in two years will want to rely upon different factors to render that kind of decision making. And if the decision making includes, well, what did the public say in terms of a referendum, you won't know based on this question. You may know based on the five seriatim questions that were on here uh, more, and I would probably support if I was on the committee at that point, uh, the inclusion of those questions on a referendum two years from now, when it's more tough and when those questions could be framed to actually reflect the then pending uh, legislation. That's my view. Okay. Cheryl, you still feel, have you? Well, look, I, I think that that's an appropriate question for a referendum. I think, I happen to agree that Jackie's question sort of doesn't let you understand what they're actually answering. Because, you know, if you want them to allow growing, but not selling, you want to allow distribution, but no retail. So I think you have to, if you're going to do it, you have to do the, the separate questions. 
So would you be amenable to doing the separate questions on a non-binding referendum at the next general election? Do I think that it's premature? Yes. Mm -hmm. But am I going to stand in the way of it? No. Okay. That's terrific. Tara? I think that it's premature, and I think that it needs to be the four different um, questions, and I think we should wait till 2020. Okay. So but since we've tabled this resolution, do I ask the committees for a vote if we would put this on a non-binding referendum back to the four questions we presented originally? Kit? Well, wait a minute. You've got yeah. this on for <coughs> old business for discussion, so you would have this on for the next meeting. Uh, I you guess know it was on we have enough time? Bring, oh, Does yeah. It? Yeah? Yeah. Okay. What are the to costs? To bring this resolution. The cost for the referendum? Out. Nothing. Yeah. <coughs> the county good. clerk does it. It's absolutely free. We so need. if we do it in 2019, we're going to definitely do it in 2020 again. We're going to have the referendum twice. We don't even know if it's going to be on the ballot. Right. It might not be. Right. It may be moot in 2020. We right. might do it again in 2020. It may be moot in 2021. Right. So we have like no idea. Who knows? But no. That, if there's no harm. Well, there's there is harm. There's a there's well, a cost. Sam, it's a public cost of burning the burdening the public with answering questions that may have no relevance to anything. I, two I years think, from now. But I, I think I would take that, that, that burden for the public. Mm -hmm. I think that our residents right. have, have voiced their opinion in numerous ways, both publicly and privately, that they would like to take the pulse of the community. And since we have an opportunity to get ahead of it and do that, I, I see no reason why we should not. I think the prudent thing is, you know, this is a, a microcosm of the Milburn's roughly 20,000 uh, 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 residents, no matter what the voting numbers are here. There will be a referendum in 2020 in New Jersey. We don't know if that you for want, well, the, well, We don't know that for That certainty. supports my position that we shouldn't right. be doing this. But assuming that there is, wouldn't you rather know what the state feels about this and then ask our community do you want to opt in or opt out? Because again, you're going to have to go to the community to the extent you so want to go to the community post. twice. And if so it you changes, know. then you'll have more data right. to make more more intelligent decisions. I think if you look feckless answer, asking this question now and then re asking different questions. No, you can ask the same. I, think you should I don't think that anybody opt out and not allow. Okay, that's fair. Opt out. Fine. Right. I think it's important that there's five of us who are making decisions for an entire community. And it's only fair when we have the opportunity to go to the community that we do that. But we're not making any decisions right now, and we ha will have another opportunity to do it again. Well, okay. So it just seems premature and... So we're going to agree to disagree with that, because I yeah. think it's important. And I'm seeing a lot of head nods in the audience, so I'm not seeing from this small sampling. What happens if it comes back that the majority of the residents want all of it? Well, then That's I guess fine. we'll find out. Then we'll find out. Right. Then we'll have, then we'll are making, right, people are making such binding. assumptions about how this is right, going to exactly. go. Well, you know what? We'll find out okay. in November. So what? we will reword this again, yeah. and we'll have it on the next agenda for a vote as a, resolu a resolution, a resolution, and that will be our final decision. With the breakout of the four questions. The breakout, breakout back the to the four, four questions, questions. So and we we make we sure maybe we can simplify yes. the language so that bit. they're clear, concise. Good. Okay. Is this on no. no. Okay. But feel free to email all of us. Okay. I right. always return my emails, okay. so I would love to talk to you. But you can even call me. Okay. All right. Or you can feel free just to email the mayor and deputy mayor. Any way you want. Why would you do that? Why would you do that? <laughs> Why would you do that? <laughs> Email all of us. Those who want to Why communicate will communicate back and feel free to call me. I talk. Old fashioned landline, even. All right. Move new business. Alex, are you. Yeah. Um, so, sort of continuing on the path of. of uh, uh, ordinances and proposed ordinances that can um, assist in the, the business community, business districts. Um, the the uh, zoning zoning ordinance that governs signage uh, is being is in the process of being revised and went you know uh, bring in front of the committee for their uh, for their uh, look at it and, and whether there were any comments from the committee. Some of the larger um, uh, items in in this are. That it is uh, looking for an increase in, in wall graphic height, um, 
uh, combination of uh, making window graphics the temporary and the permanent window graphics um, a combined um, uh, percentage. In other words, 25% of your window uh, in the business districts would include both temporary and permanent. Um, details on calculating wall graphics. Uh, the, the, the revised ordinance would allow for blade or projectile, uh, projectile uh, signage. Uh, sandwich boards would be regulated and would uh, require the removal of signage after a business goes out. Um, you know, th that's just sort of a, you know, high level sort of uh, quick hits on it, but um, certainly if the, the committee has any comments or questions, uh, I'll bring those back to those that are working on revising the ordinance. Can you just explain wall graphic height, like, I mean, on the window, what they can print their name with their store on the window? No, this is this is actually dealing with what, what is what is on the wall of the building. So, like a mural? Like on, on the top, the signage on the top, so if you take, oh, you know, okay. not, not necessarily on the window, the window graphic. No, and what's canopies? You have awnings and canopies different? Uh, yes, they are. They are distinguished in the ordinance. Um, I, I I would not be able to tell you exactly what the difference are, but, um, but they have been uh, distinguished. This, that is not a change in the ordinance. That's not a change. Okay. I think the blade signs are great. I walk to Tara store, for instance, and I walk by it and walk by it again, even though I know where it is. I think that is really an important improvement that we allow that. The and sandwich the, boards, are, is there any, because I, I, how do we govern the sandwich boards in terms of, of what they look like yeah. and, you know, so, aesthetics and things like that? Yeah, in, 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 in the ordinance, it, it states, uh, one of the more important parts of it is that it states the, Can you tell me where you are? Uh, this is under, um, I'm sorry. Yeah, they're not paginated, there's no pagination. Wall, graph wall graphics here? No. It Ground is, graphics? Um, it is four uh, under H, four okay. B. Um, and it actually refers back to 609.10 F. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Could look fine. This is cute language. Oh, no, yeah. <laughs> so um, yeah, no, basically, right. again, with the sandwich boards, what it does is, is the sandwich boards, uh, it, it indicates the size of the sandwich board, which is important. Uh, it indicates the location of the sandwich board, uh, that, it, that it has to be a certain distance uh, to the um, closeness to the building. It also uh, gives some brief elements on the, uh, the material that it should be wood or, and or metal. So chalkboard boards? Yeah, I think the framing. Oh. The, the framing is the important part, whether it's, it, the framing is wood or metal. I think the issue is right now sandwich boards are not even allowed. No, no, I and know they that, have them. But, yeah. right. so now we can make them uniform and follow certain regulations. <clears throat> so where do we move with this? We just keep looking at it. No. So I think uh, certainly if the committee has any additional comments, mm -hmm. I mean I know you know it, in, in addition to tonight, you let us know. Who's been drafting it? Um, this has been a uh, combination effort of some um, some architects um, that have. In town? Experience. Yeah, Jim, Jim Weil in particular, who has um, okay. was on the DMDA review right. committee and had a lot of ex experience with the sign ordinance, but also now is being reviewed by the planner, uh, the zoning officer, and and, um, and uh, others that were involved in the group with uh, committee woman for business. And some <coughs> other stuff. Oh, so you worked on this? Yeah. So when Paul Phillips comes back on August 13th, is this something we can also talk to him about? Yes. Because he'll be familiar with what we've decided. Correct. Okay. Correct. So, Tara, who else was working on it? Merchants? Some merchants, or um, who else was that? It was it was um, um, Ileana. It was Ileana okay. Katz and, okay. and um, um, you know some others that that uh, had were originally a part of the design review committee right. for the DMDA. Right. Okay. Um, and sort of just transferred into a, you know a good group yeah. to work on the okay. side ordinance. I was just curious. Yeah. Okay. So, so it's just a handful of people. Yeah. Right, you can't do more than a handful. Right, yeah, it was just, and really it wasn't really any, I don't think any merchants were sitting so. at the table. So will this be um, enforced, will this be uniform with the Upper Milburn Avenue as well as the downtown? So will, will, will all the... Uh, it, 
yeah, it, it, with the exception of the elements that um, are in, in the um, that are specified by under table of design elements, it specifies what district it's in. So B three and B four have the same requirements, which is your downtown business and your and your neighborhood business. Um, where B one and B two, which is Morris Avenue and the mall, have similar. So it's in this design elements table, but yes, there will be consistency uh, within within that and throughout the ordinance for, for all of them. Uh, however, however, those specific uh, elements, such as um, projecting signs, are applied in those. For instance, projecting signs would be allowed in the B3 and the B4, but not in any other uh, district. So speaking of Ileana, I saw her last night at the chamber, had a really lovely event at La Pergola to bring in their new board and to honor Lynn Ranieri. And she told me she was outside measuring for our electronic sign board. What is the update on that, if you have, since we're talking oh, signs? Sure, sure. sure. Yeah. Um, the, sign, <laughs> the sign has been, uh, has been ordered. Mm -hmm. um, the, the, what we're doing now is we're working on um, the, the, the design of a, a nice encasement of that in front of Town Hall. Um, you can see that we removed the bushes. We were uh, fortunate to find that we had electrical service out there already, nice. which was hidden in the bushes, so that uh, um, decreases some of the expense that was associated with putting it in. Um, but now we're looking to uh, to have a nice encasement of that that you know kind of matches the building, um, and so they're they're working on some of that for us. Um, the sign is projected to be delivered on um, July fifteenth. Fabulous, and Great. it's going to have like graphics, not just. Letters. Like yeah, it, have, it, like it is. It is essentially the 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 same as the middle school sign, with the exception of that plastic piece at the top. Perfect. It's just the sign. Anybody else have anything they'd like to talk about tonight? I call for adjournment. May I have a second? Yep. Second. Good night, everybody. Thank Good you night. for coming. Oh, pop pop.